Welcome everybody to the Sports Medicine Research Rundown, hosted by me, Tim Tyler. I'd first like to thank Rob Shapiro and Donna Steele for their tireless work in uh, helping me put together this podcast. And the premise of this podcast will be to take a surgery or a pathology each month and go over the past, what's been done in the past, what's what are we doing now, and then what are future thoughts by uh, by the surgeons that uh, we're going to get to join us each first Wednesday of the month. And the premise of this really was from your father, Dr. Nicholas, who I heard in Grand Rounds from 1991 till he finished, when he finished uh, being the chief, 95, 96? 97. Yeah. He used to say, guys, the, the literature wasn't invented when you were born. When you were born. Mm-hmm. So That's correct. I, I think it's always good to talk a little about a little bit about where we where we're coming from and how we make the therapy the rehab the surgery uh better um as we go on in time uh but we will be dropping this podcast the following friday after that wednesday on youtube and also spotify so if you miss it live you can totally go back and uh, listen to it on your commute home in the gym or wherever you like to indulge in your podcasting um Without further ado, our special guest tonight is Dr. Stephen Nicholas. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing Dr. Nicholas since 1991 when his dad hired me at the Nicholas Institute of Sports Medicine and Athletic Trauma to be a physical therapist on staff there. And um, I've just learned a ton from him. He he is, um, I covered roll hockey in the Meadowlands with him. I covered the Jets, the, the Islanders, the Rangers. We did Manhattanville College, Hofstra. I traveled a lot of places with Dr. Nicholas taking care of all sorts of athletes, from bridge players who are athletes your father taught us, to ballerinas, to hockey players, to wrestlers, many, many people, um, many, many athletes. Um, You're with New York Orthopedics now and and Northwell Health and the director of the Nicholas Institute of Sports Medicine and Athletic Trauma. And the reason I asked Dr. Nicholas to be my first guest, not only because I I totally learned so much and respect, respect him so much, but also because he has a unique experience being the son of James A. Nicholas um, to talk about the history, the present, the present uh, treatment of ACLs, and where we're we going in the future. Um, I guess your da- your dad was doing a five and one extra articular procedure back when you came on board, right? Or maybe you can take us oh, through well, your when I was, you know, okay. Well, first of all, thank you for being for allowing me to to come and participate in this. You know that uh, physical therapists are really the heart and soul of the orthopedic surgeon. And without you guys, we don't get any results that are good. And many times your great therapy saves us from maybe a procedure that wasn't as good as it should have been. Um, But yeah, if you want to talk about the history of ACL reconstruction, I kind of lived through it. Obviously, my father was a well-known orthopedic surgeon who was taking care of Joe Namath back then. And back in the 60s, there really wasn't a lot to be done about ACL reconstructions. And a lot of it was done was with extra articular reconstruction. So I was not in practice when the five in one was used or developed. But when it was first started, you know, this was an extra articular uh, procedure. They did a meniscectomy, advanced the postmural capsule, advanced the PES tendons, and did everything they could to tighten up the tissues around the knee in order to help stabilize the knee. We know now that's not ideal. And that resulted in many of these athletes getting arthritis. In fact, I've, I've done knee replacements on a number of the former Super Bowl Jets, uh, Emerson Boozer, John Schmidt, Dave Herman, Joe Namath, Rich Castor, a lot of guys who played over the years for the Jets who had these reconstructions. Um, but, you know, later on, uh, they became uh, more aware of the fact that we had to do something anatomic. One of the other operations my father developed was the tibial band pull-through procedure where they took the iliotibial band with the bone block of a Gurney's tubercle, put it behind the knee in the over-the-top position, through the notch, and then put a screw in the very front to hold in position. This was an attempt to do an uh, anatomic reconstruction. So that's where it all started. And then it evolved from there, Tim. We can go through whatever you want to do. When, when you were going to um, going through residency at the hospital for special surgery, um, were they doing bone tendon bones there yet and doing uh, anatomical reconstructions with uh, Dr. Marshall and those, and those fellows and John Fegan or what was going on? 
Well, Dr. Marshall had passed away long before that. He had, he had done in the 60s um, primary repair of the ACL, and he passed away in 1978 when his plane crashed. I'm um, actually an interesting story. I was supposed to be on that plane with my father. We were invited to be on the plane with my father, but my father decided to fly commercial that day because he was covering the the uh, the um, Olympics in Lake Placid. We flew up commercial, and Dr. Marshall flew in his plane and crashed his plane. But he was doing primary repairs, and after that, when I was an intern at Lenox Hill Hospital. Uh, my father was doing reconstructions of the STL, beginning to use the patella tendon, and then when I went to special surgery. As a resident between 1987 and 91, first we're doing patella tendon, looking through the notch. So we take the patella tendon, put retractors in, look through the notch, figure out where you have to make your drill hole, make your drill hole, and then um, use the notch-assisted reconstruction of the ACL. <clears throat> and that later uh, converted to doing the arthroscopic uh, ligament uh, reconstruction. When the uh, ACL reconstruction done arthroscopically was first developed, they would do a lateral incision to make your drill hole in the lateral side and then a, a small needle incision to make your drill hole in the needle side done arthroscopically to help you assist in where you're making your drill holes. And then that later evolved into doing an all-inside arthroscopic ACL reconstruction where the patella tendon was used and drill holes were made from within the joint, not from outside the joint, to place the graft in the proper position. What are the majority of the surgeons using now? A two-incision technique, a one-incision technique? Do they go through the grass harvest site? Um, what is what is what is the uh, what are the most procedures today? So look, there, there's a number of different procedures that are done today. You can look at the hamstring reconstruction. You look at the quadriceps reconstruction, and the patella tendon is really the tried and true method that probably most of the guys who take our NFL teams would tell you they're going to do that on a professional football player because it has withstand withstood the, the test of time. It probably gives you the best stability and earliest fixation of the bone to bone with screws so you can move the uh, patients a little bit earlier. Uh, people are doing all arthroscopic reconstructions, whether it be patella tendon, quadriceps, or hamstring. Hamstring, quadriceps, relatively new. Hamstring was the alternative to the ACL being done by the bone to patella tendon bone. And that was a quadrupled hamstring graft. When I was a uh, first beginning as an attending in a when as a chief resident uh, at special surgery, we did a randomized prospective study with Russ Warren doing 100 consecutive hamstring tendons versus patella tendons. They were not quadruple. They were doubled hamstring reconstructions. But the failure rate was about 10% to 12% versus about 2 to 3% for the patella tendon. Then later on, we began to quadruple the hamstrings to get more strength. And if you look at the pullout strength of hamstrings, it's very, very good. Uh, the graft to failure strength is very good, but the problem is you have four strands. So you have to balance them absolutely perfectly to make sure that they're actually sharing the load. And if they're not balanced perfectly, you're getting each individual small strand getting loaded on its own. So in response to that, another graft, soft tissue graft, was developed. And probably the last five years, the quadriceps graft was developed. So you can take the quadriceps tendon and you can use that to reconstruct the ACL. The advantage being it's a large piece of collagen. Uh, also, the fact that there's one strand, so you're not trying to balance the different strands to share the load. The disadvantage being that you don't have early fixation techniques with bone fixation, although the fixation, soft tissue fixation techniques have developed and become more effective recently. And then the, certainly the most tried and true method is the bone tendon bone autograft, where you take your patella tendon with 25 million bone plugs on either side, we put the bone plugs in the drill holes. We fix them with screws. And that allows for great plus strength and early mobilization. Yeah, that was the question I had because the bio biomechanical properties of the ACL autographs are that the ultimate load of failure that most resembles the bone tendon bone is the quadricep tendon. The hamstring tendon is twice as much. But the stiffness is very different between those graphs, the native ACL, the quad tendon, the bone tendon bone, and the hamstring tendon. The stiffness of the quad tendon, which people are going to now, is probably twice as much. And I've heard you say that well, we could put a steel rod in there if we wanted to, but maybe that's not so good. So is when you're thinking about your graft selection, do you think that stiffness plays a role or you're more worried about ultimate load of failure? Or is it the aperture fixation of the 
bone plugs in the bone tunnels. Where, what's your thought process as you go through that? Well, uh, I would say number one, the most important is load to failure. So you have to have a graft that withstands the same loads as a normal ACL, but all three of those meet that criteria. And number two would be, I would think, early fixation. And early fixation, I think, is best with patella bone, patella bone. Although the techniques with the quadriceps are quite good now, soft tissue fixation. Um, and I think if ideal worlds, if the hamstring could be perfectly balanced and all four strands share equally, then you'd have a very strong, good graft. But I think the likelihood of you sharing that graft equally with all four strands is not high. And many of the studies doing done looking at the uh, quadruple hamstring versus the quadriceps have shown an increased failure rate in the quadruple hamstring. And I think that's the reason why. So I'm looking more for early fixation and somewhat similar stiffness, but more important, a low to failure to withstand the results, withstand the demands on the graft. The article we're reviewing tonight, uh, tonight did not have did not talk about prehabilitation. Can you give us your thoughts on um, physical therapy or rehabilitation prior to surgery, and what you want therapists to emphasize, athletic trainers to emphasize, and what you look for prior to surgery? Well, I think the most important thing about prehab is first of all getting somebody hooked up with a qualified physical therapist who can help with the fear factor that comes in with these patients and help them to adjust to the fact they're about to undergo reconstruction. The other important thing is to understand that the graft, the uh, strength uh, gains you gain prior to surgery are lost almost right away. So I, I'm less concerned about the strength gains, more concerned about range of motion. And we actually did a study where we looked at, certainly Don Shelbourne popularized the fact you just have to wait two or three weeks to let the knee calm down to decrease the risk of arthrofibrosis of the knee. We looked further into that, and we actually looked at patients who actually lost any loss of range of motion, that loss of extension, and found that if you lost extension pre-op, then post-op you had a much higher instance of losing your extension, whether it be a, a three-degree to five-degree loss of extension or 20-degree loss of extension. So the most important thing in pre-op for me is to get the extension back. If you're bending 110, I'm okay with it but you must have full extension in the prehab. So the prehab would be more psychological effect on the patient, obtaining the range of motion, most importantly, uh, extension. Every ACL that I see, once I see them in the office, I got to start them on prone hangs, which I'm a big believer in, much different than a supine leg on a bolster with the weight on top of it. I think prone hangs get your extension back. And I think that's the biggest role of prehab. There, There is some controversy. There are some physical therapists that don't, particularly like prone hangs. Um, I've been using them all my career. I don't have a problem with them because you don't, I guess. And, and a lot of uh, a lot of surgeons don't mind when I ask, can we do them? But um, it's not only just prone hanging. you got to get that extension passively, as we learned. And then you got to turn them over and capture it actively. Just to have it passively is not enough because you'll lose it. That's why the weight-bearing study that you did was so... Uh, was so important because when you put people weight bearing and randomize them prospectively to weight bearing and non weight bearing after ACL reconstruction, um, what you found was that your patients that were weight bearing, you called it capturing the quads. You want to talk about capturing the quads and full weight bearing after ACL reconstruction, and then we'll talk about yeah, the patients so you know, that were weight bearing. Yeah, so no, I think I think that um, what we did when I first went to practice, people were non weight bearing ACLs and putting on partial weight bearing toe touch with crutches and. You know, it didn't make much sense to me. You put an isometric graft in. It's not getting a lot of load walking with full extension. So we randomized groups of patients in the full extension weight-bearing versus uh, protected weight-bearing. Looked at those groups, looked at KT-1000, looked at a um, number of parameters. Nothing was different except those patients who had early weight-bearing had a much decreased, a significant decrease in the instance of patellofemoral pain. I think it's because we load the patellofemoral compartment, nutrition of the articular cartilage occurs, and we capture the quad because you're firing the knee. So the quadriceps is riding up. You're not getting patella baja, which occurs when you're taking out an autograph from the from the patella tendon. And I think that's why the results were better in those patients who were fully weight bearing. So I think certainly I use prone hangs to obtain passive range of motion, turn them over and do quad sets to achieve. Um, I was active uh, activation of the quad. And I use, you know, the other side to help teach the side that's affected 
how to contract the quad because people usually can't contract it for the first four or five days after the injury. And again, the first four or five days after surgery. Um, what, what about your thought on, uh, on weight bearing without a brace and using just crutches, which has seemed to be a trend across the country that I know that you put your ACL, uh, your ACL reconstructed patients, no matter the graft in a knee immobilizer locked in extension until they get the quad firing. There's some push now right. to just give them crutches and no brace. What's your thought on that? So I want them off crutches as quickly as possible. I'd rather them off crutches and we're using a brace with full weight bearing because if you're on crutches, you're not fully weight bearing. One of the reasons I use the, the, the brace locked in the extension is because I've had some patients have pseudo buckling. One fell down the stairs, you know, because right. and if they, when they wear the brace, it catches the knee. So I use it as a safety factor. I get rid of the brace immediately when they have full uh, um, leg liftability with no extensor lag. So there's no lag at five days out to get rid of the brace. But usually it takes two or three weeks to get rid of the brace. But I use the brace as a safety factor, but I want to get rid of the crutches right away. In fact, when I send someone to therapy and they come back in two or three weeks later and they're still using the crutches, the therapist gets a call. Is there any ACL reconstructed patient that you won't leave there? I, the only one that I can think of possibly that you would suggest that in, based on my experience with you, would be your meniscal root repairs. Um, do you do, you, do you weight bear your meniscal repairs now and your meniscectomies? I know you do. But what about the repairs? I have, I have always weighed more my meniscal repairs that are not root repairs. And the reason is the compressive force along the knee when it's an extension has compression, the hoop stress is used to compress the meniscal repair, which helps in healing. When you have a meniscal root tear, those hoop stresses are translated into a tensile load on the repair site. So I don't weight bear my, my root repairs because I don't want to load intention the root repair. But if you load a meniscal repair that has intact roots, you're just increasing the hoop stress on the, on the meniscal repair and the opposition force is greater and you actually enhance healing. <clears throat> Excellent. Um, what about the role of allografts? I know that the moon data showed us that um, that we should not be using allografts in males and females under the age of 25 um, because of the massive failure rates approaching 30 and 40 percent. Um, what about what about in your what about in your older patient who really doesn't? Uh, is there any role for allografts now at all in in your practice? I use allografts. I use them rarely. Um, if I, I'm 63, if I had a patella tendon that was, a, a, a ACL was torn, I'd probably have a bone tendon bone autographed, okay? Because I think I'm doing it because I want to put the load through it. Failure rates are high with allograft. You get a, an a immune response, and that's why younger people get a more immune response and fail. Um, in a really low-demand athlete, I don't think it can handle the pain of donating a graft, then I'll do a allograft. But most of the time, I'm encouraging autographs. Okay. And for revisions, my preference for graft okay. is the opposite patella tendon, which makes it miserable for the patient for two weeks. But ultimately, my revision results are quite good. Okay. Um, the one thing we have to look about is you know, primary repairs and, and the um, the bear technique and all these things have become popular these days. And so, you know, uh, social media and advertising gets out there. And obviously, patients are going to choose the least resistance uh, option, which would be a bear or, or primary repair of the ACL. But I think the results of those are, are probably not as good as we think they might be. I think that the results of these are in two years are fine, but in two to four to five years, you're going to see failures. And I think there's nothing more depressing than somebody losing a season who was a high school athlete, having a technique that's not optimal, coming back and have had this experience multiple times, trying to play and then now lose a second season. Didn't we, didn't we go down that road in the past where we put in DAC round ligaments, Kennedy LAD augmentation, some of those artificial things into the knee 
And are we doing that again? Is that is that what's going on here? Or what is what do you? Yeah, think? well, I mean, you, you know, the bear technique you're using something to enhance the biology that you can put in and get these uh, ligaments to heal properly. I don't think there's really great evidence that says they are healing with the same tensile strength as normal graft. Listen, we went through the primary repair of the ACL with John Marshall's early data, which sort of reported 90% good and excellent results. At three or four years, they stopped doing them because the results were so terrible. So I think that primary repairs occur. Um, some people do them much more than others. I think if you're going to do them, you need to have to peel off lesion in a young person with an almost fully intact uh, ACL. The mid-substance tears, I don't think, heal well. The blood supply is affected. And you get a small atretic piece of, of uh, ACL that just doesn't heal. But for a year or two, the other stabilizers are quite good. So you can say, I got a great result, and everybody's telling their friends to go get a primary repair, and ultimately we're redoing these in the future. And I've revised quite a few primary repairs where you wonder if those were included in the successes because they didn't go back to the original surgeon. Yeah, the outcome data is still kind of wishy-washy on the primary repairs, that's for sure. But it is a sexy, sexy procedure for someone that just wants a scope, you know? No question. Um, uh, the, the you, know, you know, parents also want the smallest incision, mm -hmm. and a well done patella tendon can be done through an incision about 22 millimeters, 23 millimeters. As you know, you've seen it, it just takes yeah. a surgeon to take a little bit of time to do it, and you can get a really small graft and really cosmetic appearance. Absolutely. Um, I was wondering, um, about the um. Forgot. Rob, help me out here, Rob. What was I wondering? Hmm. Actually, I was going to question. Talking about incisions. <laughs> when I was at, I was with a student with Rob years and years ago, and the incisions were more, they were vertical and horizontal. They switched it up. Is there a reason, or is this more for looks, so to speak? Well, I, I make a horizontal, I would make a vertical incision on the medial border of the patella tendon. And the shadow of the patella tendon, the shadow of the prominence of the patella makes that kind of disappear. We average, you know, in a, in a young, healthy person, between 20 and 25 millimeters um, to take the graft. So if you do it in the right position, immobilize the tissue underneath it, you can get a really small repair, a small incision, and then you can do a plastic surgery closure. The techniques are quite good with that. Obviously, some people keloid, you can't control that, but the length in the side, the length of the incision you can control, and just with a little extra time, five more minutes of the OR, you would do a really nice job for these people. Okay. So horizontal enough. or nice, horizontal and nice, but you have two horizontal graphs, two horizontal incisions. They really are twice the length that we make for our patella tendon. I'm, I'm, I remember. I'm getting my birthday's Friday, so I'm getting older. All right. So and now I remember that. Some of the augmented uh, procedures that you do for revisions, the LLT, is that it? And the uh, extra articular. LLT. The ALL. So we are the the explain literature is it, full. Explain it. Explain what that is for the physical therapists that don't that haven't seen that, and I haven't seen a lot of them. A few. So okay. So the LET is an extra articular tenodesis where you take the iliotibial band and basically wind it on the lateral side of the knee to prevent the anterolateral translation that it can occur with the pivot shift. Um. The literature is full of extra articular lateral re reconstructions done in the past. It resulted in um, later arthritis. Now, some of the studies with the LET have said that arthritis has not occurred. I'm skeptical. If we look at them in 10 to 15 years, I think arthritis will occur. The ALL is a ligament that is in the front of the knee. It passes from the proximal portion of the lateral collateral ligament and an area just near Gertie's tubercle. Um, between girdies and the fibula head, and we make two drill holes and re repair that ALL ligament with a graft. In my hands, that works pretty well, and it is anatomic. So you're not further constraining the knee. It's allowing for the normal motion of the knee. <clears throat> um, one of the things I do is for any really loose person who's got a really bad pivot shift, then I'll do the ALL in conjunction with the reconstruction. But that would be rare because most of the time you don't have to do it. 
for revisions in order to help the revision and decrease the failure rate. I will do ALLs almost all the time. Excellent. The, fu um, the future of ACL reconstruction, are we going to be putting uh, stem cells in there and growing it back? Are we, are we going to be uh, creating uh, um, new ACLs on the table and then putting them back? I mean, where, where do you see the future? You work pretty closely with Arthrex and uh, what's, coming up, what's coming down the pipe? Well, there are a lot of companies that are doing stem cells and things like that. It's not just Arthrex. So we work mm -hmm. with all of them that, that have these products. But I think that ultimately um, we'll be using bi biologics to help to augment the repair of the um, ACL. And so we're not there yet, but with genetic engineering, biologics, we might be able to grow our own ligament. We've grown our own articular cartilage now. I think in a matter of time before these things happen, we're not there yet. Okay. Before we go over the article, Rob, are there any questions or Donna questions from the audience that maybe we can entertain at this point? Before oh, we'll we start? I have a few if nobody puts stuff up. Yes. Um, Good. What's the thought process? What if somebody has concurrent meniscal other injuries? Does it how does it affect your ACL graft choice? Is that effective for stability or? So no, it, you want to do the best graft choice you can get, particularly the concomitant meniscal pathology. So right. it doesn't affect my choice, nor does it affect my rehab, unless I'm doing a meniscal root repair. You know, most people who have an ACL tear, as you know, are slowed down from flexion more than 90, 95 degrees for the first two to three weeks. The meniscal repair is in a bloody milieu and it's got a lot of healing factors that are surrounding it in the in the bloody knee. So I, I really don't slow down or change my rehabilitation protocol uh, unless it's a um, meniscal root repair and I do not change my graft choices. And then what's your thought on like seeing more, especially more in Australia, because that's where they're doing dealing with more copers, non-copers, non-surgical. Are they effective? I know that I've heard... There's guys who will keep people immobilized to 90 degrees to let it heal. Is that something you agree with, don't agree with? No, I, I don't agree with it uh, because I think the downside of the failed ligament is significant. I think that um, Lynn Snyder-Mackler obviously has shown us that there are copers, but the predictive capability of the doctor to find out who the coper is, I think is not there. So if I'm having a person I know is going to put a high demand through the knee, then I'm going to go ahead and do a ACL reconstruction. Interesting enough, you know, in Europe, they're doing mostly hamstring tendons for these uh, soccer players um, and they're high demand athletes. But I speak to some of the European doctors that look, if it's your star, star player, what are you going to do? Well, in Spain, they're probably going to do a hamstring, but in some of the other places still go to the patella tendon. Yeah, these ten the hamstrings tend to lengthen over time or long term effects. Is that the? They, well, they, they stretch out over time. They have a higher, slightly higher failure rate. And, you know, if you look at the um, return to speed of the athlete who's given a hamstring, uh, there's a somewhat reduction in their speed postoperatively. So I don't think taking the hamstring tendon in a person who relies on velocity of their running is a good idea. And Dennis has the young eyes. So you want to read that question, Dennis? Do you mind? See out there? I'm going to put my glasses on. I'll put my glasses on. Yeah, yes. The question that came in is, you mentioned graft for the ALL. What graft do you tend to use for that? So you can use, either use um, hamstring autograft, but my preference is allograft hamstring. And why, why allograft in that instance is? Because we know that when the, the allograft doesn't sit in the synovial fluid, there's less reaction and degradation so the results are quite good. This has been shown to be the case in UCL reconstructions of the elbow, using allograft versus autograft, very little difference. And I think in the knee, using extra articular reconstructions and using allograft, there's no significant difference in the results. So I'd prefer the, um, the allograft because I don't want to take another part of the body. You got one more, Donna, before we start? Yeah, the question that came up. Uh, yeah. says I've from Seth says I've had more patients asking about going the conservative route. 
to try avoiding surgery altogether. Most are middle-aged and trying to just be able to casually ski and play with their kids, maybe do some running. What are your thoughts on this? Have you seen research saying that there's a downside to getting the surgery several months after conservative management fails? Well, no, I think that it's perfectly reasonable to try to conserve the management. You have to inform the patient of the potential risk. We're not doing the operation to stop arthritis because we haven't shown that it stops arthritis. However, we do know that an ACL and stable knee can result in an increased number of meniscal tears. So you have to tell them that the natural history might be they have a meniscal tear. They have to be watched closely. And I'll tell those patients, look, no problem. But if you have a buckling episode of more than once or twice, you're done. You're a failed conservative care treatment. You need to have surgery. So I just go right. over the, the risks. But if they start buckling, then I tell them they have to come in. I, I did to go back to that. I remember early in my career when I started working with you, we got some patients from the Stedman Hawkins clinics and they were doing the healing response. Do you remember the healing response? Yes. yes, I do. In fact, I was just teaching at the uh, fellows meniscus, the fellows uh, cartilage course with a doctor who was with Dr. Stedman for many years. And, you know, he was talking about the healing response and how they had some good results, but, you know, a lot of those patients came back and we followed them over a longer period of time and they were loose knees, but ended up being copers. So, you know, 40% of them did pretty well. Yeah. And they, they kind of prayed that we should be doing this. And so we were doing a lot of it, but that's kind of disappeared now. So if it's disappeared, you know what it means results were. The, for those of you who know, the healing response that Dr. Uh, Richard Sedman did is when he would go into uh, the knee arthroscopically and he would just pick at the tibial origin of the ACL. Femoral, femoral origin. Femoral origin. Femoral origin. Okay. okay. And in hopes it would heal and seal and, and reattach. And if there's a proximal lesion, you might get that to happen. We now use techniques where we sew the ligament back to the femoral side so it actually touches the bone. But he did that in hopes that he could get it to heal. And listen, we always can laugh about things we did in the past, the way we'll be laughing at what we're doing now. So I never, ever... No, well, anything that was done. Um, but, you know, he in his hands, he had good results. And Dr. Stedman was a great surgeon. But I do think that, that those results aren't as good or reliable as reconstructing the ACL. And years from now, we'll look at what we're doing and say, well, you know, you can put this magic dust on it and they heal. Why didn't we do that back then? You know? we'll, take, we'll do more questions after your article. Let's switch gears and go after this article for a second. This is an article by Jay Ebert, who, uh, who comes from uh, the country of Australia. Um, Austria, and where they do some, where they do hamstrings and quad tendons. This is a pro prospective randomized control between those two graphs, and um, it it was a very well done study. Um, they had ample power to detect changes both between the groups, within the groups, and over time. Okay, um, the procedure used, Doctor Nicholas, is that a similar procedure where? where you're uh, using a uh, Arthrex um, all soft tissue graft and using an adjustable yes. loop station. Okay, yes. excellent. They talk about graft tensioning performed in the extension. Is that what you do? I know you did a graft tension study um, way back in the day. Um, tell us about how you tension the graft in the OR. So we, we looked at how far, there's a bunch of different things, how you treat them afterwards, fully weight bearing how you select your graft. And then when you're in there, when you set your graft, where you put it, how you get it there. Do you do collinear, transtibial, or do AM portal? And then once it's in, when you're setting the graft, how hard do you pull it on the graft? So, you know, my training under Russ Warren, the great, great surgeon and great mentor, um, he was a very strong guy. I used to set the graft kind of tight. And then I did my fellowship and they were setting a bit loose and you touch the graft and you'd you'd see it kind of waving a little bit. And I said, it didn't make much sense to me. So, but nobody had an answer of how hard to pull it. So we randomized two groups and one in a tight 90, 90 Newton pull and one in a 45 Newton pull. And we looked at those patients over time and the KT-1000 in those patients that were loose or pulled or 45 Newton pulled, the KT-1000 is a little bit looser in those patients, still with a good endpoint. What made sense to me, though, is we're trying to decrease translation in the knee as long as you're isometric to do the pulling harder so that you can prevent the translation of the knee, which I think was the purpose of the surgery 
decrease shear forces on, t- on the articular surface, and I think are better results. So in my hands, I pull at 90 to 100 newtons and almost full extension because it's an isometric graft. Okay. Um, very similar. The rehabilitation is very similar to yours, I think. Um, they they um, emphasize... Well, the problem with this study is that they, really, they, they did not have a they did not have a consistent rehab program. That's one of no. the studies with this problem. Hey, study, so. Excellent. Right. Correct. The, out, the clinical outcome scores, they used a bunch of them. They kind of went on a fishing expedition there looking at the lysome, Tegner, Cincinnati knee score, the, K, uh, the knee outcome score, um, survey of activities. They looked at a KT-1000. They looked at a lot of different hop tests, um, the six battery hop tests, which are listed in the paper. Um, maybe more importantly, they looked at peak uh, peak knee extensor and functional force, which we also be look, looking at if we're lucky enough to have an isokinetic dynamometer. It's certainly the way to go. If not, a handheld dynamometer and getting a, a brake test force and comparing a side to side difference, which is now called a limb index uh, limb index symmetry, um, is good is is an excellent uh, way to measure. Knee, uh, knee and hamstring ex, um, force. Uh, the results of this paper. So, uh, so, so wait. So, let me just interject yeah. here. So, no. you, here. You, you have patients who see an ACL, and the first week you examine them. Is the wound infected? How's it look? Are they getting terminal extension? Is patella mobile? That's the first week. At six weeks out, okay. Do they have full extension? Do they have quad control? Are they off the brace? Are they off the crutches? Are they moving well? Right. Are they flexing to 110 degrees? Then three months out, or you have all full range of motion, good quad control, 70, 80% of your strength, walking heel toe without problems. Six months they come back, and we know that's the nebulous time. They feel great. They want to go back to activities. We kind of hold them back because you know the biology of healing takes longer. And then we bring them in eight months, and they come and visit you like you do a Lockman. It's okay, you're ready to go. Why? Magical? No. What I do is I think you need to assess the patient. Like I don't have a KT-1000 in my office. I don't have a, 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 a isokinetic tester, but I do have my eyes and I do a single leg hop test and look at the patient and see if the patient is able to heal, land on their heel when they do a single leg hop test, because that means they're able to withstand the shear forces put across the knee. But when they do that and I see them go heel to toe, rather than the foot slap that you get when you're putting your your toe down first, those are the ones I know are able to return to play. Certainly, I'll test hip flexion, strength, and stuff that I can do. But in the office, that's what we have the ability to do, evaluate them. We can't put them on a field and watch them run. But it's a really nice test we do to evaluate return to play. So sorry to interrupt you, Tim. That's all right. No, serious. So return to play. I, was, I wasn't going with what, we're, what you're doing. I was going with just what the article was doing first. Yep. Um, no, I know yeah, that, we'll but I just say how, what we're thinking fine. when we do it. Segways right in. Um, they had 116 people in the study. Um, 112 got surgery. At 24 months, they had 97 patients that were followed up. Um, it was interesting to see what the failures were, and there weren't many failures. Certainly, the um, uh, the ipsilateral retear was only one in the quadriceps tendon group, and the contralateral retear. Is that really a failure, though, if you have a contralateral ACL tear? Isn't that why you're having no. an ACL reconstruction to order to go yeah. and go and play sports and maybe tear your, your good ACL, I well, think. When I see a patient in my office who tears their other knee, I feel terrible for the patient. When I see a patient in my office whose knee I did and they come back and tear it, I feel terrible. There's a difference. You know, there's some guilt that I feel, even though we know these, these can occur. But they tear the other side. It's just their natural biology of the knee and their morphology of the, of the notch that caused that to occur. The um, the uh, confluing, uh, conflicting health, uh, they lost five people in each group, the hamstring group and the quadriceps tendon group. So we can go over the results now that, uh, that were uh, interesting. And the one thing that I took away from this was that if you go to the, go to page six, uh, 665 and you look at those, those uh, bar charts there and you see that with the uh, return to sport index, both graphs return to sport. Um, but if you look at the peak hamstring tor- torque, just like you talked about earlier, Dr. Nicholas, 
those soccer players, they lose hamstring strength. They lose that ability to generate torque quickly yep. and they lose speed and it, and it lasts. And it's interesting to see in the study that it lasts for a long, long time where the quadriceps yes. strength does come back. Um, and you can see that on those, on those charts too. Um, Rob, you have anything to add on that? No, actually just looking interesting part was the, um, what were they talking about? That, one component, um, being afraid to go back to the field, you know, somebody who has a hamstring injury. Psychological. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The hamstrings are more likely to be able to return than the quadriceps. Yeah. Do we know, is it more of a, is it surgery based or just technique? You see uh, something on your knee. What do we think? Biopsychosocial versus true? Well, I think, that, I think the quad graft is right in the front of your knee and the hamstring is in the side. You don't see it. Makes sense. That's yeah. personally what I think. But there's no, you know, I'm just conjecture, but this is an obvious kind of a strange assumption. But there's no reason, if all the parameters are the same, that there'd be more confident one versus the other. Right. But interesting, they, they do catch up, but it's early, you know, the early ones. And also, graph say pain is more in the hamstring than is in the, in the quadriceps. So you'd think they'd have less uh, confidence returning to play when they're having more pain. Makes sense. I think table table four and five really was the take home for me that there's no difference in in uh, knee stability. The KT one thousands are pretty similar for both the hamstring and the quadricep tendon grafts. When they even broke them down into uh, into uh, you know uh, groups, sort of like the zero to three, the three to five, and the five over, they were very very similar. Um, if you look at table five there, and you're looking for limb symmetry index, uh, as we would expect. There's a time effect, there's a groove effect, and there is an interaction effect with knee extensors, with knee extensor uh, peak force there. Uh, so you would expect that, yes, the quadriceps get stronger from the day after surgery until 24 months. You would expect that there's a difference between quadriceps strength and the hamstrings and the, and the quadriceps tendon graft, absolutely. And then there's the interaction because the interaction shows us that they get better from time to time to time at six months, then at 12 months, then at 24 months, okay? And that's what you see there. There's no interaction for knee flexitor, okay? Why is that? It's similar similar to what we see, Dr. Nicholas, I think, and you can maybe speak to this, that the hamstrings really come back quickly after your bone tendon bone surgeries. Would you say that or not really? I think they really come back quickly. What's the function of the hamstring in flex position to prevent anterior translation of the tibia? So when you're when you have a ham and, and this is all just my personal thought process, but you had a hamstring reconstruction you've done, you affected ultimately the strength of that hamstring, and you're loading that graft, which is, you know, I think at risk without the con- contradicting force of the hamstring. I think you're loading the graft. I think you have a higher chance of failure just based on that alone. For this for some of those um those those um Hop tests and stuff like that. There, were, there was not much difference between the two groups, except for which one was it? I have to find that. So medial. Mm-hmm. The L, the LHD, and the MHD, and that was the single medial hop for distance. There was a difference um, between the groups, and there was a significant inter- interaction effect. And for the the um, LHC, which was the single single lateral hop for distance, there was also a significant interaction effect. You can see that on table five. So overall, I think that uh, anecdotally, even though lingering hamstring related issues occur, we have to talk about that. You, like you spoke about, we have to warn the patient about the um, the soreness, the cramping, the sensation, um, maybe recurrent strains and loss of speed. So take that into consideration. But also on the on the quadricep tendon, I mean, what's one of the injuries that we see a lot of? What do we? What's going to happen with those quadricep quadricep tendon harvest site graft sites? When the patient is 55 years old, we know that uh, adult males do have a higher incidence of quadricep ruptures than females um, as they age. So what will we see down the road? Will we see more quad tears than those folks possibly? And then what kind of, um, what kind of uh, graft do you take? 
some surgeons were taking a piece of the patella, um, the superior pole of the patella, as they harvest the quadriceps tendon and use that on, as fixation on one on one tunnel and then a soft tissue fixation on the other t- other tunnel. I know Dr. Um, I know Dr. Um, Texas doctor Walt Lowe was doing that. I spoke to him extensively about this as I was preparing for this journal club. Um, do do you use a do you strip it and take a whole soft tissue um, quadriceps tendon, or do you use a bone plug out of the patella? So, in my opinion, the advantage of the patella tendon, bone tendon, bone, is you have two bone fixation sites. When you just take the the patella piece and the rest of the quadriceps, you have one bone fixation site and one soft tissue fixation site. The soft tissue fixation site is going to guide your rehab protocol, right? Because that's the one that's the, the most at risk. So it makes no sense to me to introduce the risk of taking a piece of bone for the patella, which the risk is patella fracture and patella pain, bone pain, and still have to slow down your rehab program protocol. So if I'm going to do a quad, I'm going to do soft tissue quad. And if I want bone tendon bone or bone fixation, I'm going to do bone fixation on both sides. Okay. So I would do all quad if I was going to do it. Excellent. Anything about this article, Rob, you want to point out to the audience? or? Um, or yeah, I just have a question, article? really basic okay. question, Doc. Um, when you do the bone and the soft tissue fixation, which is the more proximal? Does it matter? I know it sounds odd, but which is the most? How do you fixate? The soft no, tissue? you know it doesn't. It doesn't matter. Um, I would put in the femur, which is the more difficult spot to to kind of get fixation, and then on the tibia, you can pull it in and kind of fix it on the tibia and kind of tension it that way. I think that's easier. So you could do it either way, but I would do it on the femur. Okay. Thank you. Before we open it up to the audience questions, I have one last question for you, Doc. Um, what is the role in post-opposite, post-operative bracing? The, uh, the, I mean, the Lennox Hill brace was world-renowned for Joe Namath, and people used it over and over. You know, uh, your father invented it. Um, it was because- invented by my father. Yep. I know it well. Um, and you think if anyone should use braces, it should be me. But I don't really use post-operative brace other than to treat the head of the patient who lacks confidence. So I'll put the brace on to kind of give them confidence. And that's probably about 10% of the people. And I'll brace them for the first two months back. And then as they're running around, they don't think about it, they remove the brace. But I don't think there's really good evidence to say that it prevents a re-injury of the ACL. There might be some evidence that says it helps you to play with an ACL deficient knee but I don't use it to prevent injury. Yeah, there is there is there is ample evidence that shows that an ACL reconstruction post-operative brace does not prevent rotatory instability with that brace on. No, but it can but prevent it, MCL. I was going to say that it might, help, it might have it help that offensive lineman who gets rolled up on. You know, that could that yes. maybe, and it could slow down the athlete a little bit, which then you could say would prevent the risk of injury a little bit because they're not achieving this high speed. Okay. I think That's all a... the questions I had. Any other more? There has to be more questions. Please, everybody. Uh... There was one Great question questions. from Rob. Does Dr. Nicholas ever use an internal brace? So, the, the, listen, internal braces are very hot. And so I think we did one of the first internal braces ever. And if you look at the... American Journal of Sports Medicine, we described our CC ligament construction. We used Merceline tape in addition to a cadaver graft to help to support the, the CC ligament. That Merceline tape was an internal brace. I think an internal brace is, is fine to use. Um, I use them rarely um, because I think that the graft works very well and doesn't need the internal brace. And I want the, the graft to see some stress and I think the internal drip brace can stress shield. So I don't use it for intraarticular reconstructions. I will use it for extra articular. If I'm doing an MCL or something like that to give you early, early um, stability so you can move the knee and stress it, I'll use it for that. I haven't used it much intraarticularly. What else do we have? Um, There's another question. From, yeah, you got it? 
Yeah, if you want. Yep. Any concern of when the graft is most vulnerable vulnerable in the 11 to 14 day range? Well, yeah, there's concern, which is why when we full weight bear them, <clears throat> we have them use a brace until they have no extension lag when they're walking. Because when they have no extension lag, they don't get the pseudo buckling and they don't stress the graft. But as you know, walking with your knees straight doesn't stress the graft at all. The most stress the graft that she has, receives the first three months after the reconstruction is the patient coming to the office and the resident does a lockman and the fellow does a lockman and the medical student does a lockman and then the doctor does a lockman. So I, I really try and limit that to the patient. I do one quick, one quick test and that's it. And I don't let the other guys do it. So um, yes, I have a concern about the graft being vulnerable. We try and limit the the uh, stress on the graft by our rehab protocol. Now you mentioned Lockman. Do you ever use the lever test? Or Lockman is your standard. Lockman is my standard. Let's see if there's any other questions. Doc, I have a question for you. It's too long to write. Um, when you re when you review studies. And you look at, you know, when you were a resident versus where you are now, and you think of the way we used to rehab, right? ACLs used to be casted at 30 degrees. You take this mm -hmm. cast off. You have this thin leg. Then you have to break up adhesions. You're beating the hell out of the mm -hmm. patellofemoral joint. And then you're doing knee extensions on isokinetic units or orthotrons, which continues to beat the hell out of the patellofemoral joint. And then you have this outcome, right? How do you view... The differences, whether it's the differences in the progression of rehab or, you know, in, in your thought process of what was done compared to what you're going to do now, like the evidence of the past. How do you how do you do you view that any differently because of the differences in the rehab or anything? Well, else? yeah, listen, we know we know you're not supposed to do. And I can't tell you how many times someone comes in and they're doing the extension exercise post up. They're doing them all the time. That, that drives me a little bit nuts. I can't tell you how many times people ignore proximal limb musculature, you know, hip flexion, seated hip flexion, as you know, I'm a big yep. believer in that anytime I send somebody. Um, abduction, adduction, look at that, mm -hmm. ITB stretching, all the things we have lost. But one thing I use about the past is I don't get nervous as much when a patient comes in has a little bit of atrophy or a little bit of stiffness. Because really, as you know, we saw them when they were stuck at 30 degrees of flexion and couldn't move at all, right? right. So, you know, it's easier to say to yourself, Oh, it'll be okay. Whereas the young guys, oh my God, what's going on? We got to reoperate right away. You know, sometimes the tincture of time goes a long way. So, I think that's something um, that's where I've taken the past. I think that's something I learned from you and working with you is that it's all about the extension. If we can get their full extension passively, capture it actively, prevent the fly cops lesion, we'll get flexion as long as we take care of the patella mobility and the graft harvest site. You know, that's something that Rob, you taught me as a student. Yeah, Rob P. Yeah. Rob, what do you take? Rob. Let me spin that let me spin that question back on you, Rob. What do you take from it? I, I do, I do, you know, obviously I'm not a surgeon. Uh I, I try to familiarize with my, myself as well as I can with surgical techniques and go in the ORs as often as I can. But I'm like, you know, I realized that we had a high incidence of patellofemoral pain, you know, back then mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of the breaking of adhesions and the force flexion. I don't. I don't think we had as many problems with patella because of the harvesting of the grass. I can't prove that. Yeah. It's just anecdotal. But you know, and, and so my concern shift in regards to as we eliminate things, become more progressive. Um, like we did a study at HSS um, ACL reconstructions. I, you might have been there at the time. So remember, we used to take care of the PSAL. So we looked at mm -hmm. return to play. We looked at previous previous levels of return to play. And we had in this one study, we had a very high incidence of the our athletes not, not having the ability to return to the previous level of play. And when you looked at it, a lot of the surgical candidates were high school football players from the PSAL, which you know have very limited opportunities for scholarships. Yeah. So the yeah. main reason in this particular study why they couldn't return to play was lack of talent had nothing to do with the surgery, right? Because they couldn't play football again because they had graduated. They mm -hmm. weren't good enough. Mm -hmm. And so I just try to, you know, I try to look at just things like that. You know, is it really the rehab? Is it really the surgery? Or 
you know, was the surgery good? Like, you know, you talk about ALL, you know, I don't remember this, the study we did years ago with Russ and Dave with using the lateral, you know, the ITB as a lateral sling to reinforce. Mm -hmm. I think in that study, 40% of the patients, 30, 40% of the patients had prolonged lateral knee pain. But because yeah, you captured the lateral side of the knee. Right. And, but with an extra tibial reconstruction. And were they casted? You know, because they're conjunction the so did this thing scar down? Where if you did that now, they're not, you know. So I just try to look at it like that, you know. Mm -hmm. And then obviously, well, you know, it's like yourself. Well, you say, well, you say, we say we can't prove the telepramal pain. Listen, I think we did prove it in our study, the full yep. weight bearing study. We reduced our incidence of telephone pain to eight percent. We also looked at patients who came to the office with telephone pain, looked at the hip flexion weakness, and we found that eighty five percent of people who had their hip flexion weakness corrected, had resolutions of their symptoms in their patellofemoral joint. So okay. we've proven that rehab intervention can affect patellofemoral joint in two different studies there. There's other studies that look at adductors and ITV stretches. Sure. We didn't do those, but we know that the, the rehab can affect patellofemoral pain. And certainly rehab after an ACL reconstruction where binding that down is probably even more important. Yeah, and I agree with you, Doc. I'm just talking about um, back then, physically trying yeah. to break adhesions and forcing flexion oh, yeah because you know, we don't do that yeah. now so i don't know i can't you know i can't delineate how much patellofemoral pain was caused by that versus now that's mm -hmm. that was the types of things i'm talking about but i agree with you 100 percent. i think that if we treat our acl patients like patellofemoral patients we'll we'll do okay yeah so i want to thank everybody for coming tonight um We'll be back. We'll be back the first uh, the first Wednesday of next month with uh, the Tommy John surgery, and we've uh, we've wrangled Doctor um, who's coming to Rob, but Doctor uh, James um, Doctor James Ahmad James, James, James Dr. no Pacey. James Pacey. Pacey. Okay, good Doctor Ahmad. I tried. I couldn't get him. So if you, I try to keep writing him, but he ignores me. Even though he answers my LinkedIn, he doesn't write back. So I operated on James Pacey when he was in high school. I did a slap on him. He'll That's tell funny. you. Yeah, he went to the high school right there, near my office. That's funny. So listen, I, I, I got to thank you guys for allowing me to come in. As you know, I love talking to therapists. I think that not enough doctors pay attention to therapy and not enough doctors know about therapy. So they can't have these conversations with you. And I think we learn more from you than you learn from us. So I thank you for having me. Well, thank nice you, doctor. Nice to be here. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Rob. All right. Bye -bye. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. Thanks and good night. Bye-bye.